The information we're presenting in this webinar is believed to be accurate as of today and is presented in good faith, um, but should not be used uh, solely for making investment or um, uh, investment or, or marketing decisions uh, completely. Good afternoon, everybody. And um, in this in this first part, uh, Brad, uh, Ricard, and I. Um, we are going to give a brief overview of the economic implications of COVID-19 on food and agricultural markets. Next, please. So what we are witnessing as consumers and as businesses in the fruits and vegetable supply chain is an unprecedented situation in, in which we witness both, both shortages and and waste of wasted food production, as uh, the popular press uh, has has mentioned over and over in several uh, in the past few in the past few weeks, um, milk being dumped, uh, crops not being uh, harvested, and at the same time, in empty shelves at the stores uh, for many for many product categories. Next, please. So, uh, to to give you an overview of the in, of the impacts before uh, allowing my colleague Brad Ricard to talk, is I want to share with you uh, um, responses to appalling questions to uh, on a program for United Fresh uh, trade show that we a program we did last week. Uh, we got responses from about 150 businesses, mostly operating in the US. So we were interested in four questions. The first one is what parts of your supply chain are more at risk? What challenge, challenges are you facing? So, and here is a list of what was highlighted. First, the food service shut down. The second concern or what is at risk is securing seasonal labor. Um, procuring direct materials and, and, and packing facilities uh, operations, the health of workers in all segments of the supply chains, and also is risk about managing inbound deliveries and spikes in the flow of products to avoid the contagion uh, among workers. So we see it's a, it's, it's a combination of shutting down of some marketing channels and uh, com combination with the protection of the labor force. The second question we ask is, are you, do you actively communicate with your customers and suppliers as a result? And the response was overwhelmingly yes. Uh, this crisis has sparked increased communication to manage disruptions in terms of understanding volume caps in deliveries, a, a collaboration on product repurposing, particularly from food service to, to the grocery retail channel, um, some uh, flexibility in terms of qualities of the products, assortments of the products, etc. So, so this crisis has led to much more frequent communication to manage the high degree of uncertainty that markets, particularly for perishable products, such as uh, anything that is in fresh products, are facing. Next, uh, please. <clears throat> so, so the next question was a. Uh, Talk about what are they, how is the industry responding? And we made a selection of, of responses from the question, have you made innovations due to COVID? For example, adapting new products or new channels or selling your products or developing online business models. So in general, most of the business that we talked, either if it is a grower, packer, shipper, a wholesaler, or a, or a retailer, a, is a, that they initiated in many cases or ramped up online channel, as we are going to talk later through this through this presentation. Uh, also, this crisis has sparked lots of horizontal collaborations across supply chains that usually don't talk to each other. The food service and the and grocery retailing. We have seen um, 
Many are establishing grocery store re restaurant collaborations. Mm, uh, suppliers are also developing solutions like consumer box for retailers to minimize handling of the product. Uh, less product assortment, managing a, a much limited product assortment and, and, and trans, implying a, a, a transition from fancy foods to the basic in, in, in fruits and vegetables. The other effort that was interesting is to see there are lots of effort to uh, products that are, are, are uh, distributed in bulk are now trying to be distributed use, using bags to minimize handling. Many are modifying production lines uh, and enhancing cleaning protocols that have increased cost of productions. Wholesalers along the fruit and vegetable supply chain working hard on repurposing product from food service to grocery stores. And many, many businesses have weekly COVID meet meetings. Um, for example, for school nutritional programs, also we have found we have found that many are preparing. For the for 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 how to how to deliver the food to, to students under the new under the new conditions in some states, the other the other comments also is the realization that we are in this together, even as we compete, industry is collaborating, mm, huge educational and training efforts in the industry to face this new reality, to educate, to talk to each other, to learn. Um, also, this crisis has uh, made more evident the need for tools to assess risks in the supply chain in the future, uh, not focusing too much on, on cost efficiencies, but, uh, but more on new tools to, us to, to, to enhance the resilience of supply chains. There are multiple concerns. There is, is this going to lead to increased consolidation, leaving medium and smaller size businesses in the industry out? Uh, what, to what extent are our costs going, going to increase and who is going to bear these costs? Um, and the biggest also is in the future, lower consumer income. How, how is that going to affect the the food spending. And the other thing that they mentioned it was the need to ramp up automation efforts at all levels of supply chain to, to depend less, less on labor um, and, and, uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, next, please. So, just uh, some of the some of the impacts uh, in retail, which is my area. Here I am showing you by type of retail to understand the extent of the impact of the industry, and this is for the whole U.S. This is comparing U.S. monthly retail trade, comparing a uh, March April 2020 to March April last year, and you see that uh, <clears throat> that grocery stores have. Been, have experienced a surge in sales, 30% in March compared to last year, and 13% in April. Um, you see others, other other areas like gas stations are really going down, and you see the in the bottom the big hit on food service and drinking place minus 26.7% and minus 52% in April compared to last year's and, and that is one of the biggest biggest uh, biggest impacts because a, a, about a third of fresh produce goes to food service. Next. So some trends and observations on the impact more at the consumer side and in grocery retailing is consumer switching to online and direct shopping models, increase switching between brands. Uh, people are becoming less loyal to brands. Again, as I mentioned before, from fancy to basic foods in food consumption, um, increasing groceries consumption and decreasing food service industry, lower frequency of store visits. Uh, people are going less frequently to stores and purchasing bigger tickets because they want to go minimize uh, the risk of, of going shopping. And also, we have seen a change in the seasonality of 
demand for products in big big goods, soups, etc. So in a way, the forecasts methods that we have used in the past in the industry to forecast consumer demand are not working now because consumption is disrupted. Grocery retailing is focusing in, on work pay, workforce safety, uh, redesigning of stores and workflow to minimize risks. Uh, they are facing tremendous uncertainty on supply. That's why we have, be, we have seen stockouts uh, of different product characteristics as, at different times. Increased demand. Demand have, uh, have increased at least 50 to 100 percent in different categories when we compare to last year. Increased procurement costs uh, as well. And the, even though they are selling more, some of the retailers are saying that the bottom line is, is, is not, has not improved because even though they are selling more, they are they are experiencing higher cost of labor, but higher cost of procurement. Uh, and packaging switches uh, are urgently needed to adapt to demand, and for that they need close collaboration with retailers, with, uh, with suppliers. Next one. And with that, I will, I will I will pass. Uh, I will let uh, my colleague Brad Rickard work, which is he's going to talk more about upstream supply chain. Okay, thank you, uh, Miguel. And I just wanted to start with a slide to uh, uh, from a quote that I saw recently that talked about uh, food systems. Um, it's a word we use and we hear uh, quite commonly, um, but in fact, I think we're we're recognizing through this pandemic that uh, there really is not a food system, but multiple crisscrossing supply chains, some connected and some not. And I think this is especially true in the, in the fruit and vegetable sector. Uh, next slide, please. Here um, is, a, I think, a nice illustration of uh, monthly retail sales of fruits and vegetables over the last five years. And the red line is fruit uh, retail sales, and the green line is vegetable retail sales. And you can see that almost every year, vegetable sales peak uh, around the holidays, sort of somewhere between Thanksgiving and then again uh, during the, the December holiday period. Um, and fruit sales, the red line, you can see they peak almost every year over the last five years, somewhere around July 4th. Um, and then as we move forward, you can see as the COVID-19 uh, uh, entered uh, our lives, you can see that both the green spike happened and it didn't happen at Thanksgiving, it happened uh, early March and it happened in a bigger way than it had in any of the previous five years at their peaks. And, uh, and fruit sales also, retail fruit sales also got to that same level of peakiness um, that we normally observe uh, sometime around July 4th. I think, uh, next slide, please. The next two slides just show a little more specific detail for specific fruits and vegetables. And I think this is going to be a reoccurring theme today that, uh, that this pandemic has affected certain fruits and certain vegetables in different ways. And here you can see the lighter green line shows um, what, what is a normal pattern of uh, retail sales of these vegetable products from this uh, quarter March to June, and then the darker blue line on top shows what happened uh, um, this year in uh, in 2020 over that same time period. And you can see most of them there was this bump up, but some of those bumps were were much bigger um, in terms of dollars um, or in terms of percentages. Um, and uh, and sort of the, there are these heterogeneous effects across these vegetable categories. And the next slide, please, uh, shows something similar, but for uh, U.S. retail sales of fruit. And again, it's a very similar story. And here, in a few cases, you actually see some fruit crops where uh, there was this peak, but there are periods where uh, retail sales of some fruits are actually uh, lower during 2020, during this time period, than they were in uh, previous years. You see that especially with grapes and with watermelon. Um, you know, and I think there's a longer story here, but part of this is is related to uh, international trade in some um, fruit categories and how COVID has affected those trade flows. 
Uh, the next slide, please. So I just wanted to uh, remind us, I often have to remind myself, um, why during uh, this pandemic, um, this pandemic is certainly affecting the demand for food at food retail and food service, but it's also affecting the supply. And the way it affects supply um, leads to this perhaps non-intuitive result. We're seeing lots of cases where farm prices are lower for some commodities, but yet at the same time, consumer prices are higher. Um, and this is really, you know, this is really uh, the result of COVID impacting uh, the middle of the supply chain in some sectors. I think the most obvious case so far has been in the in the meat processing sector, where we've had much less processing capacity in the middle of the supply chain. There's been problems with uh, labor supply, um, and some people reflect upon this situation in the meat industry and 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 uh, see that this is something. This is a story that could certainly possibly evolve in the fruit and vegetable industry as well, because we're so reliant on labor supply. Um, and what happens is in that middle part of the supply chain, if uh, if there is less labor, um, then we're going to see less processing happening, you know, in that packing plant or in the processing plant. It's going to increase the costs of doing the processing, and those costs will be passed on to consumers and we'll, we will see consumer prices rise in retail markets. Um, but at the very same time, because there's less processing capacity, then they can't uh, purchase as much uh, raw material from farmers. Um, and so there's this uh, decrease in the demand for farm products and that has this effect of causing uh, farm prices to fall. And uh, and the next slide, please. This shows you uh, how this ha unfolded, how this happened. In uh, here, I put I found a picture that shows how this happened in the beef industry. So it's showing how the cattle price or the farm price of beef, the red line, fell during this time period at the same time that wholesale beef prices, um, uh, the price that uh, that processing plants sell their beef for, has gone up. And we've seen this divergence in these prices over this time period. I think that uh, at this point, I'm going to next slide and turn it over to my colleague, Liz. And then you can advance to the next slide, and Liz will start there. Thank you. Sure. Um, so, yeah, my name is Lisa Higgins. And actually, my region covers um, 17 counties in eastern New York. So I start right just north of the New York City line. Um, and go all the way up to the Canadian border. Um, and my my region borders Connecticut and uh, Massachusetts and Vermont. And so there's a lot of cross selling also with those states too, with the growers that I tend to work with. Um, so my first slide, um, observation from New York, Eastern New York for fruit and vegetable markets. Um, some of my farms reported that this has been the best spring in years. Um, that sales, um, you know, went through the roof. Um, that um, you know, most of the farms I work with are very diversified. They sell in many markets. Um, just with a little bit more context, our big crops are uh, fresh market apples, sweet corns, and onions. And I think because of our proximity to population centers like New York City and Albany, um, sales of fruits and vegetables have been really strong this season. Um, I've been collecting data on CSA farms for the past three years, and this is the first year as I've been collecting the data where large numbers of farms by June had sold out of all of their shares. Um, I didn't see that CSA share prices went up. I actually had collected some data back in January and went back and looked at those farms to see if they had changed their prices at all or anything. Um, and I did not see that prices, that they changed their prices. Um, I don't think that most folks had time to do that, but many of the farms had added additional sites um, during that period or changed some of their sites. And many farmers markets also were able to stay open, um, which was really helpful to a lot of growers, even some of our wholesale growers who were able to divert some product from wholesale chains and restaurant um, outlets that had closed um, to direct markets and farmers markets. So this was a, a really big help. Um, but these benefits were not evenly spread out. Um, I know of CSAs that relied on churches, schools, um, as delivery and drop-off points, and some of those sites are absolutely not active this year. 
I think workplace CSAs are definitely taking a hit as a lot of um, workplaces are not open. Um, and then I also had a couple of longstanding CSA farms that for personal reasons um, have decided to not go into New York City at all this season. Um, and it's unclear what'll happen to their markets. Um, their sites have all taken a break this year, but you know there is some question as to whether or not their customers will come back next year. And I think that this could be something that could happen to a lot of those sort of CSAs that um, where the site closed and those customers have either found other other CSAs or other markets to, to source fruits and vegetables from, um, because it is a, a fairly um, competitive, CSAs are actually a fairly competitive market in the Northeast. Um, to make up for drop-off sites being closed or social distancing, most of the CSA, a lot of the CSA farms are now having to pre-pack all of their boxes, um, you know, and, and be, and, and provide more supplies that way. Um, and they're also eliminating or reducing volunteer requirements. Um, and many have actually moved to home delivery as a way of keeping some of their customers. And all of these changes add costs to the CSA delivery. Um, and many of these farms don't have large labor pools. So there is a real question of what will happen if their employees get sick too. So if they've been able to expand and then they run into a, a labor issue, that could end up hurting them, you know, if they end up with customers who are then you know, dissatisfied also um, if, if they end up not being able to provide product this year. So I think for CSA farms, it's either going to be a really great year or a disaster, and it's really not clear which at this point. Um, as Miguel talked about earlier, online ordering is definitely up. Um, and as, as are questions about credit card usage that I'm getting, um, I'm finding there are a lot of farms that are, use, they've been using services like Square, um, but even more of them are taking that on. But but one of the issues is that for multiple small transactions, these services are really costly. Um, the Wall Street Journal recently had an article about these changes as being another cost of COVID to businesses that had relied more on cash sales in the past. Um, this would be typical at farmers markets, for example. Um, most of these car companies charge a flat 2.9% plus 30, per 30 cents per online transaction which is really high for this kind of a sector compared to normal interchange rates charged by credit card companies. Um, and then I'm finding some CSA farms and even farm markets are encouraging their customers to use peer-to-peer um, -peer, um, payments like Venmo and stuff um, to avoid these fees, even though Venmo specifically prohibits this kind of commercial use. Um, next slide uh, should be observations from Eastern New York fruit and vegetable markets. Um, but yeah, definitely, um, in general, though, a lot of farms really have been quick to adapt to local delivery and, and bagged produce. And this has really um, been uh, just a, a real, really fast switch for a lot of farms. Um, next slide. So federal disaster assistance has been taking up a lot of my time recently, and it's been a really mixed bag for fruit and vegetable farms. Um, there are two programs early on, the Paycheck Protection Program, and EIDL, um, which were offered by SBA, were really helpful for the farms that I work with in many cases. Um, so although they weren't in the same position as a lot of the retail and service sector businesses where they were forced to entirely shut down, um, and many hadn't brought their workers in yet. So I had a lot of farms who at first thought, well, I don't know if I really should use this because I don't, I'm not experiencing the disaster yet. But we encourage them to apply because there's so much uncertainty going forward about what will happen. And there's so many increased costs that a lot of these farms are bearing for um, additional distribution costs and additional safety costs. And there really aren't um, assistance programs that are likely to be a good fit for them for this kind of support. Unfortunately, USDA disaster assistance like the CFAT program um, isn't really a good fit for a lot of the sector, especially these really diversified um, direct market um, and direct retail market kinds of um, fruit and vegetable farms. Um, as you can see um, on this slide here for fruit and vegetable, I have um, for several of the states, um, dairy is the big winner for CFAP and that's a direct payment program um, that USDA, that's the disaster program that they have right now for farms. Um, in New York, um, dairy about a hundred and um, I think a hundred and 
1,800 um, dairy farms have received about $101 million in CFAP uh, to date, um, and about 1,700 commodity crop producers have received about $9 million. But only 24 fruit and vegetable farms have received any CFAP payments. Um, right now, for fruit and vegetable in New York, um, I think about 1.3 million has gone out. And I think that's mostly for apple farms. Um, I had a couple of onion farms. Um, but other than that, I it's it's been a very challenging or, or really not as beneficial program. And when you only have 24 um, farms, and we have just tons and tons of fruit and vegetable farmers in the state um, who've been able to take advantage of that compared to uh, like over 2,000 livestock farmers in New York um, have received CFAP. Um, you know, clearly th this is not a program um, that is really geared up for a lot of fruit and vegetable farms. And we're doing the best. I mean, Massachusetts, I think two farms have received CFAP for about $3,000. Um, four farms in New Jersey had applied, um, but they haven't received any payments yet. So this is definitely a um, program that is not as geared towards um, fruit and vegetable farms. It really was for fruits and vegetables, CFAP was more geared towards sort of dumping situations like California and Florida. Um, so, you know, that's that is certainly um, USDA disaster assistance is definitely not as um, beneficial. And then finally, um, although the most of the discussion, the next slide, please, is on um, fruit and vegetable production. Many of the farms in our region, and I'm sure many of um, our listeners in other New England and Northeast states, um, you know, agritourism is a critical source of income. I mean, sometimes for our farms that are sort of near urban centers, it's the difference between being profitable and not being profitable. In New York State, over 800 farms have agritourism ventures. And um, the census estimated that it generated over $36 million in farm income. Um, and these are, just to be clear, um, when I say agritourism, I'm not talking about um, pick your owns or farm markets, um, which are counted in the direct market sales dollars in the census. These are the agritourism, the not vegetable produce sales part. Um, these would be your farm festivals, your hay mazes, your farm stays, your hay rides your farm camps, your music weekends, your farm dinners, weddings at the farm, your hunting leases. And many of these activities are, you know, they may not be able to open this season or they'll be curtailed. Um, so the, you know, for a lot of growers, you could see in Long Island, for example, um, you know, it's $10 million in 2007 was estimated to be just from agritourism receipts. Um, and in the region, I'm in more in the um, lower Hudson Valley, um, you know, it was like about $8 million. So these are really, you know, significant. Those those farms right around urban urban centers, you know, were often, you know, you had also significant COVID um, restrictions. You know, they really rely on this. And, and so I'm not really sure what will end up happening. So in summary, I'd really like to, you know, I'd like to sort of leave you all with this. I think this could be a really good season for many New York State fruit and vegetable farms. Um, certainly demand is up. But it's really going to be dependent on what happens, I think, with worker health, with local and state and regional restrictions on economic activities, and then, of course, weather. Um, but it's really exposing, I think, um, some of the weaknesses in our assistance programs that are aimed at traditional commodities and, and weather disasters to be able to provide that support um, to you know, really highly diversified fruit and vegetable farms. So I guess I'll turn it back to, I guess, Brad. Um, uh, meets me, please. Thank you. Oh, oh, Sorry. Uh, so I will go briefly through through a couple of slides here to give enough time to Brad and and, and Rich. Uh, but some of the likely effects and and, and 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 responses that we need to look in the future in fruits and vegetables here: income decreasing and the price of food likely to increase slightly. Slightly, that is, uh, consumers will tend from to shift from fancy foods to basic foods. The other point there that is important is uh, the need to strengthen food assistance programs, uh, demand for food, and in particular, fresh products in food banks have increased. So the federal government has the, the, the Farm to Families Food Box program that uh, is small, but is, uh, is requiring, is, uh, is helping, you know, delivering boxes directly through food banks for direct delivery. So that's a program that, that, 
that uh, is likely to increase in the future. Um, the second is food hubs is, is sourcing from local and regional foods and delivering to households likely to grow. And I think this is an opportunity to invest in the growth of these emerging supply chains um, with the support of technology and supply chain coordination. And one thing to note is that the demand for fruits and vegetables in, in, uh, in uh, hard discounters and dollar stores have increased and are likely to increase more. Um, and these uh, retailers, in particular dollar stores, are increasing the assortment of fresh produce uh, and other fresh products in their in their offerings uh, so how you know is i think the the the, the message for for the audience are there is strategies to increase the presence of northeastern grown products uh, in these retail outlets the sec the next please so uh, and uh, and uh, uh, important to know what the, the payoffs of increased cross-channel collaborations and partnership is evident in the in the crisis. We have seen as between restaurants and local food stores and between supermarket supply chains, wholesale food supply chains and food banks. So these crises have created, uh, uh, as Brad mentioned at the beginning, understanding that this food system is a network and we cannot think about linear supply chains, but but uh, there are lots of cross-channel collaborations. Innovation in product product repackaging uh, towards the future is how can you repurpose easily product from 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 say food service to grocery retail and vice versa. I think that will be an important effort. <laughs> uh, the, the, this. Crisis has also highlighted uh, supply chain diversification as a way to become more resilient. Many buyers that used to rely only on two, maximum three suppliers are understanding that you need a larger base of suppliers to ensure a product availability and reduce the risk of, of um, stockouts. And technological solutions are emerging. Online marketplace for companies to collaborate, both vertically across companies, but also with the customers. Uh, speed up, we are going to see a speed up on efforts to, to automate uh, various segments and particularly labor intensive activities in supply chain. Data sharing technologies to increase vertical supply chain coordination have existed, uh, but due to lack of trust and really willingness to collaborate between the members have not been used, but they have been used more now. And uh, also this is a huge opportunity for businesses that introduce new technologies uh, supporting the use of uh, surplus foods to avoid waste. Next, please, Brad. Okay, thank you, Miguel. Um, and I had some, uh, also had some final thoughts here. I just wanted to share uh, about uh, fruit and vegetable markets in uh, in New York, but also uh, throughout the Northeast. Um, and I think I, I said this, but I just this is one of my main points is that. Um, and my colleagues are also emphasizing this, that this, this pandemic is gonna affect producers um, in different ways. And it's, it really comes down to you know, the nature of the product, how storable or perishable it is, um, what are the labor requirements, what is the labor supply um, for that particular farm. Um, the macroeconomic conditions are certainly gonna play here. I think this comes back to Miguel's point about um, simple versus fancy um, food products. Um, and then this, uh, the shift that we're seeing seems to be a sustained, will be sustained shift towards online grocery sales. Um, for annual vegetable producers uh, in particular, I think, uh, you know, relative to perennial fruit crops, they, there still is some limited window here to think about uh, the trade-offs for producing different vegetable crops and, and being coordinated with, uh, with other growers in your region thinking about uh, you know what will the demand be for these crops 
is there any difference in the demand this year relative to uh, recent years? Um, and I think we've tried to point out that there are some, there have been some indications of fundamental shifts in, uh, in what's being consumed or what will be consumed in 2020. And I think there is a lot of, uh, there is this possibility for uh, positive outcomes for uh, certain farmers in certain regions in the Northeast. Um, and in particular, opportunities for small farmers, farm market vendors um, that might have uh, an opportunity to seize uh, uh, local regional markets. Um, I think there is a little bit of work effort that needs to be done to think about uh, facilitating online sales for this group of producers that perhaps isn't as used to, uh, hasn't had as much experience with that type of sales. Uh, the next slide, I believe just provides a, an image of uh, how that uh, online grocery shopping has changed um, during the pandemic. And you can see that, you know, there certainly is, and this splits it up between uh, people between the ages of 18 and 44 in the teal color, and then uh, people 45 and older um, in the darker color. And you can see there there is a certain population that hasn't and doesn't participate in online shopping, but you can see that there is, uh, you know, especially if we look at the first set of bar charts, we can see that there is some, uh, you know, a, a non-trivial number of uh, households that are buying online food more frequently, and it's more prevalent for the, the younger group, but it's it exists um, 45, 20% for both, uh, both of these groups. Uh, the next slide, um, I, I've just uh, tried to give you a taste. I don't have a lot of time to go into this, but I'm uh, in the midst of with some colleagues uh, across the Northeast uh, in Massachusetts, um, Connecticut, doing some survey work uh, during the pandemic, asking consumers about food purchases, food waste, and uh, what we call food values. So price, nutrition, taste, storage, ease, ease of use. And we're finding that consumers are changing their attitudes or the, the way they think about these food values during a pandemic. Price, you know, for some people, price is more important. Those that uh, are being furloughed or have recently found themselves unemployed. For other people that continue with work, um, some of them will tell us that price is actually less important. Uh, nutrition for most across the panel has been less important. Taste is less important. How well these food store is becoming more important, and then the, how easy it is to use the products, the fresh um, or packaged products, is much more important. And I think I'm just going to leave you with one final slide that uh, maybe emphasizes this shift um, in uh, in food values. If you could just go to the next slide, please. Uh, again, this tries to emphasize this shift towards uh, value. Um, during the pandemic and you can see that uh, you know in particular that second set of bar charts I'm shopping uh, for value packs I'm buying more store brands you can see this across the two age groups but you can see that uh, during the pandemic there is this increased activity for sort of value oriented uh, characteristics of food and with that I'm going to switch uh, I'm going to let uh, Rich uh, take over so the next slide please Hi everyone, uh, Rich here. Good to be with you. Um, I'm going to batting clean up here a little bit today, so I'll move a little bit quickly. Um, but wanted to really address some of the some of the labor issues that uh, revolve around uh, COVID-19 as we continue through this pandemic. So, really want to touch on about three areas. That's uh, management risk, uh, management changes, and risk avoidance. And you guys are all very very familiar with the many changes you've had to make at this point. Uh, I'm going to focus on a couple of risk areas. Uh, uh, one is fines, another is lawsuits, and the third really is reputation risk. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but uh, a couple other areas that are big challenges we won't be able to spend as much time on. The uh, second one is planning to fight an outbreak. I think there's a great risk as we head into late, uh, late summer and fall um, as our population of workers increases. You know, um, many of you will reach your maximum number of workers. Uh, in the fall and so that uh, increases the concentration of people and increases the um, likelihood of COVID-19 transmission uh, especially as we see the um, increasing um, 
infection rates in southern states uh, where people are often migrating from to the northeast into the fall. And then last, of course, is securing a sufficient workforce, another big challenge. Uh, we won't have a lot of time to get into that today, but just uh, you know, H2A seems to be working uh, both in the Northeast and across the country. Maybe not 100% of our workforce, but uh, most people are getting the workers in that they need so far. It uh, depends uh, on um, how many we get here for the fall um, when our, we reach our highest numbers, so that remains to be seen. Let's go to the next slide. So um, I do want to touch base on this issue of uh, lawsuits because uh, this is something that all producers need to have in the back of their minds. Uh, we've been thinking about the risk uh, directly from the virus and protecting our, our employees and protecting uh, consumers and others who come into contact with our farms. And that's all, that's excellent. Um, I will tell you that in the legal community, um, the tort lawyers are coming out um, and that there, there are a lot of expectations that there will be lawsuits filed both during and after the pandemic. And so if you're operating a business uh, in this environment, you need to be aware of this. I'm not trying to spread panic here. I just want it, it to be in the back of your mind that the activities that you do and the steps that you take to prevent coronavirus um, and to protect your communities, uh, your customers and your workers, um, and ultimately your business, um, all those things are to certainly protect them from the virus and from illness directly, but also to protect your business um, from the threat of a lawsuit. And right here, just a couple of examples. Uh, these are high profile companies, of course, Walmart on the right and uh, Tyson, uh, of course, a food processing and retailing uh, company. Um, they uh, are both um, have been hit with uh, wrongful death uh, lawsuits by the families of uh, employees who uh, unfortunately did pass away from COVID-19. So uh, even though workers' compensation does provide a lot of protection for employers around that, uh, anybody can sue anybody at any time for anything. So, uh, you know, there, there's always the possibility of lawsuits uh, being filed around this. Next slide, please. Um, so, Let's talk a little bit about um, protecting your employees, customers, community, and your business. And if you hit next for me. Great. This is a uh, headline, or this is a yeah a headline from a newspaper. Um, of course, uh, about a month ago uh, in New York, a large greenhouse had a tremendous outbreak with 60 plus employees infected with coronavirus. And the way that actually played out with the local health department investigating, I can share with you because I, I talked with a lot of the local people. Um, it turns out that the uh, the company, the greenhouse was doing a pretty good job and the local health department decided that likely there was little uh, transmission at the work site. The weakness was the employee housing um, and they had some temporary housing, meaning hotel rooms that they were using and the company had really no control over um, the concentration of housing and how people were um, you know, not social distancing outside of work. And that's likely where the spread happened. But that was devastating for that greenhouse. It'll take them years to recover from that. So just popping up last week is an article. Uh, this is an apple packing facility. Um, and uh, this is, I'm gonna show you a couple of items here from the, from the, art, from the article, but uh, actually the governor of New York mentioned this situation because we've had a pretty low transmission rate, but this, uh, where there were enough infections here that it was affecting the numbers for, um, for central New York. If you hit, hit the next slide button, please. I captured a couple of um, uh, bits of text from that article a few days after the initial outbreak, and I wanted to share some of that with you. So starting with that green box at the top, um, Oswego County uh, Medical Director um, said the employer is cooperating with the health department and has complied with state established COVID-19 guidelines. Hey, good news, right? That's what we want from an employer standpoint. We want words like that. If we have to have an article and something happens, we want words like that. Let's look at that middle box. It appears this cluster was initially transmitted through community spread. So that's possible anywhere in any particular community. Um, but uh, in this situation, it looks like, um, uh, you know, it was not necessarily happening at the workplace. Um, it could have been happening outside of the workplace 
um, in, in that in that local community. I will share this another Apple Packer that I've had a chance to work with a little bit, and that's exactly what happened there. They had some outbreaks, and it turned out that it was happening in the community because guess what? The uh, employees also interact with each other outside of work, which should be a surprise to no one. Um, and so, but we need to be aware of these things. We need to be managing them. Go to the look at the last block there. Um, so the uh, uh, Champlain Valley Specialty, that's the name of the packer, um, is currently working in tandem with the New York State Department of Health and the Oswego County Health Department as we as we remain diligent in ensuring the well-being of our employees, their families, and the communities in which we operate. So here's a example. I wanted to share this with you because this apple packer has, you know, unfortunately this situation going on with actual outbreak of COVID-19 among the workplace. But I think they've been managing this about as well as they could have because they've apparently been ahead of this. They've apparently been doing the social distancing of the hand sanitizer and, and all those sort of things. And um, the press that they've gotten is a lot better than it could have been. It could have been much worse for them. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so let's take a few moments to think about what you can do in your business to reduce these risks. First of all, check with your li your insurance provider about what your liability is um, and uh, what you actually are covered for. Uh, make sure you understand that. Second, follow the guidance of your government authorities. The state governments are really um, the primary authority that you need to rely on. CDC has great information out there. Most CDC stuff is in the form of recommendations and not in the form of guidance like the states are issuing. Also, local municipalities, um, so often county level health uh, departments, they also are uh, primary sources and usually the first contact. So you need to listen to what they're saying, follow their guidance. Third is train employees. So we put new policies in, we, we can't rely on just putting the policy in place. We need to train, do a great job with that. So that's what actions to take and why. It's also how to respond to questions of other people. If people are coming around the business asking what's going on inside the business, you need to train your employees to direct those people asking questions to management or ownership. Fourth, uh, follow up to ensure compliance. Again, you know, we put a procedure in place, great. We provide some training, great. But guess what? We still live in the real world, which means that things slide over time. Sometimes things aren't getting done exactly the way management might imagine that they're getting done. That's why management has to get out there, get boots on the ground and eyes in the field and see what's happening and make sure that it's happening. Follow up, circle back around, have check sheets, check to be sure that the cleaning is getting done both at the workplace and if you provide housing, make sure that you're making sure that the housing takes place there and around customer safety and all those sort of things. We, it's too important. We have to get out there and see these things and we have to document what we're doing, which brings me to the next slide. Really the fifth area of managing risk here is to document your decision-making. So uh, there's been a huge amount of change. And uh, this, uh, someone said recently, um, they're not surprised uh, when, when people make mistakes because uh, this is our first pandemic. Um, and uh, it's mine too, and uh, for all of us, I believe. We're uh, working through this situation and uh, the guidance has changed and what we're doing at our business has changed. We need to stay right on top of that stuff. Uh, I give the example of face uh, coverings. That wasn't even recommended in the United States at the outset. But after about a couple of weeks or a month into the pandemic, um, that recommendation changed and suddenly uh, businesses were supposed to provide face coverings to their employees, but you couldn't get face coverings. So what you should do in that situation or anything like that, when you're making decisions and working through that is document it, write it down. Write down that you knew that um, you were supposed to get uh, face coverings for employees and that you made attempts to get that material, but you simply couldn't. And then, you know, a week or so later, when you were, were able to find it or the, the state government started to provide that to you, then write down that you started to provide that to employees. Document what you did. It doesn't have to be fancy. Documentation can be uh, just timely uh, dates, uh, names and places written in a, in a spiral binder just to keep track of what's happening and when. Avoid any gossip or name calling because your notes could end up in court and you want them to reflect well on you as a, as a, as a leader and as a business manager. Paper or computerized and certainly maintain employee confidentiality. But ultimately, you're going to be a much better place if there is a lawsuit down the road 
if you've got good records of what you did rather than relying on faulty memories or uh, perspectives of different people. Next slide, please. We've put some resources together. This is rather uh, New York specific because we have this uh, requirement in the state to uh, have business safety plans uh, in place. However, for those of you in other states, check this site out. I think it's worth a look. Um, we pulled together there both the New York requirements and a set of best management practices um, that experts all over Cornell have uh, have pulled together. So for things like you pick, uh, for things like retail, for um, 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 for packing houses, uh, a lot of different things. Um, we've got best management places, uh, practices uh, put in place, and you can find the links from this website that I'm showing you, um, and plus a lot of other resources um, that would be applicable in any state. Next slide, please. Uh, I'll wrap up here pretty quickly, but uh, we all need to be thinking about outbreaks. I already alluded to, to uh, my concern for the late summer and fall uh, about our concentration of employees and how those employees might be coming from all over the country or different countries. Um, and uh, there is a possibility that we could have a, a, an, an outbreak of COVID-19. We need to be thinking about what we would do in that situation. We need to be thinking in particular about housing. How can we quarantine? And quarantine means they're not necessarily sick. We're just watching um, and we're um, going through a period of time of observation. That's what quarantine is, separate from the general workforce. Isolation is different. Isolation means we know the person is sick. They have been tested possibly or they just have the uh, COVID-19 symptoms and we are isolating them with a separate room, separate bathroom and so forth and providing the care they need while, the, while they recover from the disease. Those are two different things. Look them up on CDC if you have questions about it. Producers, you guys need to be reaching out right now to plan for this. You need to be finding additional housing and, and you need to be working with other growers to find that housing. You need to be working with your local county health departments to find it. Um, but get on this right now if you haven't already. Um, this is too critical to leave for the last moment, too critical to leave for uh, to chance. Testing, uh, you also need to be working with your uh, local authorities about testing and testing strategies should you need it in the case of an outbreak and also proactively. We're pushing right now, um, a lot of the counties in New York will only offer testing for farms uh, by bringing the employees to the health department sites. That's, that's, not, um, that's not optimal for sure because there's a risk of bringing people together, transportation and so forth, to get that testing done. Um, and uh, by bringing people together and concentrations like that, that uh, poses a risk of infection. So be thinking these things through and be pushing your county health departments. Not all county health departments understand the ag workforce. And so the ag communities in each county need to be pushing um, to get what you need um, and, and, and understanding the risk that we have going into the fall. Next slide, please. I'll close up here with uh, uh, just a, a little nugget of history. This is Winston Churchill at the beginning of, um, of World War II um, after uh, uh, Britain was really alone at that point facing uh, Nazi Germany and the United States was not yet into the, into the war. And uh, uh, Winston Churchill said, never give in, never, never, never. I think that's the attitude we need to have as uh, agriculture and as business managers as we confront this COVID-19 situation, which is not going away anytime soon. We need to dig our trenches and we need to get ready for a long fight um, as we get through this thing. Next slide. We included some resources that should be very helpful um, to, to get to a lot of other resources at Cornell. And I think we'll go to the next slide. And I think these will be available for you. Um, and we will take questions at this point. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Rich. Um, so we have a few questions that have come in. Um, one is for the, uh, I guess, uh, Dr. Ricard and, and perhaps Liz, well, I guess everyone really, um, is do you see that the, you alluded to the types um, of vegetables um, that demand has shifted a little bit due to COVID and due to the, the kind of different way that we're consuming fruits and vegetables today. Um, 
do you see any, you know, I'd like to press you for perhaps some specifics if you, if you know of any. Um, do you see a shift in like uh, organic versus conventional, local versus uh, not necessarily local, um, you know, types of fruits or vegetables that are, that are increasing in demand due to the shift between uh, food service markets and, and grocery retail stores? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, this is Brad. If I could take the first crack at it, I think. Um, yeah, so I think uh, maybe uh, going back to some of those slides that I showed earlier on with some specific uh, fruits and vegetables, um, it, it, you know, it appear and, and, you know, and we can look at, you know, volume of sales or dollar of sales. Sometimes these are driven by an increase in demand. And in other cases, um, you know, I think uh, onions and potatoes and tomatoes are probably a good example where because there's been a drop in demand from food service for potatoes, onions, and tomatoes, there's also been a change in the prices of those uh, those commodities. And so that, that's been part of the, the increase in, uh, in food retail demand for, for those particular crops. Um, it tends to be the things that are more storable, um, less perishable, um, overall are, are uh, are more value oriented fruits and vegetables where we've seen the biggest uh, and the data still is uh, pretty preliminary. So we, we, you know, it's hard to say with a lot of certainty, but this is where the, the preliminary data seems to suggest. And then as far as your other question, uh, which is a good one about the, you know, these um, credence attributes, the organic and the local, um, you know, it depends a lot on the consumer, but overall there seems to be, you know, this, this rise in the demand for more value oriented, more simple uh, foods. And so um, there seems to be some evidence that overall there's, there is um, certainly among some consumer segments, there's an increase in the demand for organic foods, but overall as a category, we haven't seen a, a big spike in the demand for um, um, organic uh, fruits and vegetables. But maybe Liz is seeing something, uh, you know, at the, at, uh, at a more local level um, that she might be able to comment on. I, yeah, any thoughts, Liz? Yeah, I mean, what I would say is that there is definitely, I'm hearing more demand for food locally that people can get without having to go to a big grocery store. So, you know, so I'm hearing things like farmer's market sales are very good. Um, a lot of, several of the growers I've talked to have said that, you know, they're able to, you know, sell like, you know, like put together produce boxes and things and, and do well with that. There's a question as to how long, you know, that sort of, you know, there, those markets had been sort of challenged for the last few years. And, and now there seems to be people who hadn't, bought locally as much um, maybe we're getting the organic or their well you know their local food in gross in retail in grocery stores or more traditional markets are shifting to buying more locally whether they'll stay like that we don't know um but it's that that market has been good the other shift as far as production is that some growers especially i would say vegetable growers are thinking about crops, which crops may require more labor and be lower value. So that if, you know, so that if if they need to adjust and if they run into labor issues this season, you know, they've sort of planted um, accordingly. Like they're, you know, they're, they're not taking risks with things that are really labor intensive and, and not necessarily high value. And this would be more like people that are are local and, and more direct market, just because of the concern about if your if your workforce gets sick. Okay, um, another question for the for the group is um, the USDA food box program came into a, a effect, and some of the intentions of it were to um, sort of replace some of that food service marketing channel and support food banks and also support local farms. Um, have you seen any any benefits to New York or Northeast farmers uh, as a result of the food box program, or have any thoughts on it? It's uh, it's success or progress thus far. 
Brad, do you, do you want, I mean, I know a little bit about it. Do you guys? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, so in New York, um, in general, it was mostly a couple of distributors were successful in, in winning food box contracts. And I don't, you know, the, the hope is, is that that will then um, have them source from more New York growers. But I think the jury's out at the moment as to how much impact that has had. Um, it's certainly nobody, like I, I know that there were a couple of proposals from smaller food hubs and stuff that were not successful. Um, there was, the turnaround time was really fast. Um, it was a very challenging proposal um, process for people who were not used to that kind of um, bid process. And so, so it really will be as to whether or not, um, I, I would say the jury's out as far as how much impact it's had on, on Northeastern fruit and vegetable growers. And if I may, uh, if I may add to that, uh, uh, the the program is about three billion dollars, which is about two to between one and two percent of of the products, uh, farm, the farm value of the products that are fo uh, the focal products, uh, meats and fruits and vegetables and dairy products. So it's really small. And again, what we know more nationally is that the large, for the larger uh, grower, packer, shippers, and wholesalers, uh, it's more e it's easier because uh, because contracting with the federal government uh, requires more. It is more it's more difficult. You need to go through more more uh, more forms and things like that. Okay, thanks. Um, we're up, we're already past the top of the hour, but I'm going to go a little bit over just to get to a couple more questions. I um, hope that's okay with everyone. Um, so just to, to boil down to a few takeaways, um, starting with you, Dr. Ricard, um, any thoughts as to, you know, given that it's sort of the, you know, er, very early in the season, um, if you were, say, a, a vegetable grower in the Northeast, are there some key things that you would change or be mindful of as you go into this sort of COVID impacted uh, marketing season? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And I think, um, yeah, I think I would be mindful of that, you know, looking ahead um, this summer, this fall, I think, um, you know, there is some probability that there will be a second wave of COVID and we'll, we'll experience some of these, uh, these same, sort of macroeconomic conditions that we experienced in March and April. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of signals out there to suggest that, you know, consumers in that uh, in that event, consumers do, you know, they do buy more food at food retail markets. They buy certain types of vegetables at food retail markets um, to be flexible. Um, you know, if you uh, if you traditionally sell all of your food to food service or to food retail, to to sort of think about those and to have sort of you know a backup plan uh, if the first plan doesn't work out, um, and to be you know especially yeah because we're in the Northeast and because there's a lot of consumers here who seem to be um, more interested in local and regional food to sort of explore those opportunities with with your neighbors, with the Cornell Cooperative Extension teams. Um, and I, I and I think this actually could be, you know, given all the other uh, uncertainties in the world that vegetable farmers face uh, with weather and um, risk. Um, I think I'm I'm optimistic that this could be a good year for uh, vegetable growers in the in the Northeast. Okay. Any thoughts, Liz or Miguel? Liz, you want to go first? Um, sure, I guess, yeah, I, I agree with Brad. I think that for some growers, um, this could be, you know, I, this could be a really excellent year. Um, they should definitely take, um, you know, heed Rich's advice which, um, about, you know, trying to keep their workforce as healthy as possible. Um, but it, it provides an opportunity for them, I think, to get some customers 
who they may not have reached in the past. Um, and so if, if the season goes well, this could be um, allowing some growers to expand their um, markets more directly to consumers through online sales um, and, and other marketing that they they hadn't invested as many resources in. So I think it's, you know, at least as far as online marketing and improved direct marketing, this has really forced people to up their game a lot, which I think is probably to their benefit. Okay. And I, uh, I think for you, Rich, oh, sorry, go ahead, Miguel. Sorry no, about just that. finally, just to an addition to that, to what they say, I think if possible, think about the value add added opportunities for canning, frozen, or the like, uh, so that you can you can, you can preserve more product over time. You know, one of the big issues is perishability, and and I think the the need for so they need to the opportunities for the use of the product over time is important. Okay. Um, question for you, Rich. Um, you talked about uh, the importance of keeping your workforce safe, and I, I know that you're focused on on um, ag employees. Um, but and perhaps Liz can weigh in too on this. Um, but speaking about like other people that are on the farm, things like um, agritourism, pick your own operations, operations where the where the customers are coming onto the farm. Do you have any thoughts about how to deal with the the idea of COVID and that sort of population or that um, business model? Yeah, yeah, great question. And and the first thing I'll say is that website I showed you earlier. Go to that. There are some links definitely to retail and to pick your own very specifically best management practices and those will be the, the true experts uh, in those areas really put those pieces together but overall you know it's a lot of similarities to uh, employees you know it's let's get a plan in place um, and let's uh, think about what those contact points are going to be let's have a policy for following through on social distancing when must uh, when and where do masks need to be worn and all those sort of things. Let's follow through and make sure that the cleaning is taking place the way it needs to. Let's document um, our plan and document our follow-up. But that's overall kind of the big picture there. Liz, what would you add? Yeah, no, I think that that, that pretty much covers it. I think, you know, it's interesting because I have a colleague in Western New York um, and one of the challenges I think that people who are doing agritourism are going to face is there are different sort of, there are parts of the, the region where I think the general population is very COVID aware and, and getting high compliance among your customers and understanding is, is going to be relatively easy. And I think there are other regions and other parts where you have a large segment of your customer base that you are you're trying to keep them safe and they're not helping you do that and um we just had an email from a grower who was, was saying that 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 was one of his challenges yeah. is that he doesn't have enough staff to make everybody wear their mask and and follow the directions so it's that's going to be one of the challenges is sort of helping to to both keep your customers safe even when they don't really want to you know, and, and yet, you know, and, and, and run that business. So I think that'll be a challenge this season. Okay, fair enough. And um, a comment came in from a viewer that um, other Northeast states also have similar online resources. So if you um, Google things like um, COVID in your state uh, or, or most states on their, the, the state website have, a, you know, links on their home pages. So it's worth checking those out as well as from the land grant um, expansion agencies. Um, so with that, I think you know we're a little bit over time, so I apologize for that, but um, I think we will, uh, we will sign off. A couple of um, comments, I wanna put in a plug for the Farm Credit East COVID resource page. That is farmcrediteast.com. If you go to the, our homepage, you will see a link to, the, um, to our uh, COVID resource page. It's updated frequently. Um, we update with frequently asked questions almost every other day. And um, I would also like to put in a plug for the Knowledge Exchange site and our web page, I mean, our, our web webinar page. It's farmcredits.com slash webinars. That is where the recordings for our past webinars as well as announcements for future webinars reside. 
Um, so I would encourage you to check that out. Uh, and with that, we're adjourned. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.